Here we are, lesson four, three. One of the most significant um, uh, lessons for mathematics theory, if you will. Maybe not necessarily for your particular career, whatever career you field you go into, but as far as just mathematical theory goes, for those who want to study mathematics in college, this is a very important lesson because it connects our shapes, really. I've been talking a lot about triangles. I've been introducing circles. This is the lesson that really connects the two. And so in theory, this one might be the most important of all. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is go to your Google Classroom, go to Classwork, and make sure you remember to open up 4.3. There's a few things I'm gonna point out on 4.3. So I'm gonna open this up. And of course you could use PowerSchool Learning if you so desired, but I'm gonna go from Google Classrooms document. And what I want you to see is uh, first, you know, you're here, you're taking care of number one. You're either watching live, you're in the classroom, or maybe you're watching the YouTube later uh, in the future. But either way, make sure you fill out your attendance and then come down to number three. We always open this up to submit answers to bell ringers, guided practices, and release ACPs. I'd recommend you open that up for the lesson. Uh, after that, we've been using the pre program graphs. I would still open that up. But there's one more thing I want you to open up. It's under the digital resources. And I've been, by the time you listen to this in the future, I might have it added as a bullet point right here because I think it could be helpful for your homework as well. It's this unit circle help. So I'm going to open this up. We're going to use that a lot today once I start the lesson. This right here, it's what we call a unit circle. Let me see if I can blow it up just a little bit. There we go. We're going to use that quite a bit today. But for the bell ringer, I'm going to need up my special right triangle trigonometry link. So that's what I'm going to use here. And let me close off some of these tabs. I just got a million of them open. All right. So let's go through working uh, some of these problems. Number one, it says a cable holds an 80 foot pole straight upright as shown. What is the approximate length of the cable rounded to the nearest foot? And so here's what I know about trigonometry is that uh, I've walked you through. The easiest way to solve these is if you have a triangle, that's right triangle, meaning a right angle, for step one would be to put the angles on the x-axis. So I'll ask you right now, my two angles, would these be on the x-axis or y-axis currently? All right, we're good. So what I'm gonna do here is I'll just extend the axis a little bit so we can see it. There's the x-axis. This represents my y-axis x and y like that, the 62 becomes theta. Theta is 62 degrees. That's step one. Now step two, anytime you wanna solve this, what I would recommend is you place your unknown variable, the unknown variable above the known variable as the trigonometric ratio. What am I talking about? All six trigonometric functions have a ratio. We're gonna set the unknown over the known to help us choose which of the six we should use to solve the problem. So I see in our instructions, they say there's an 80 foot pole. So I'm gonna to go to the pole here and say that pole is 80 feet. And I'm gonna ask you the question, is this pole in the place of X, Y, or our hypotenuse? It's our Y. So Y is our known, it is 80 feet. Our known is Y which is gonna equal 80, I'm gonna put that here. Well, no, I'll leave off the 80. Our known is Y, that's what we know. Now, what are we looking for? What's the unknown? The cable, we're looking for the cable. And Diego, you're right. The cable is the hypotenuse, it's the slanted portion. This is what we're looking for, that's the unknown. So I'm gonna put H here. So step two consists of, consists of us discovering which of the six trigonometric functions we should use to solve this problem. So you're looking for H over Y. Only one of them will be exactly hypotenuse over Y. Cosecant, very good, CSC. So CSC has H over Y. It's the only one in that setup. So that's what we're gonna use to solve. So cosecant of my x-axis angle of 62 degrees will equal the unknown hypotenuse divided by our known y value of 80 feet. So if we're trying to solve for h, that means we need to isolate it, get it by itself. And to get this by itself, you have to do the opposite mathematically of what you see. Right now, h is being divided by 80. What's mathematically the opposite of dividing by 80? 
multiplying by 80. And so if we type that into the calculator, as long as we're in the right mode, we should get the answer. So I'll come over here. And what do I mean by the right mode? So my calculator, if you open up your pre-program graph, I have it set to be in degrees, but most calculators standard are in radians. So just heads up, if you're using something other than mine, that you'll need to switch to degrees. We type in 80 CSC of 62 degrees. It says round to the nearest foot. So this would be approximately 90 feet or 91 feet? 91, 91 feet. That would be the length of the cable. So that was the, uh, number one. Two steps for solving most right triangle problems. Unless they're asking you to solve the entire triangle, that's where you have to find all three side lengths, all three angles. Um, then you'd have a couple extra steps. All right, let's take a look at number two. Um, if cosine theta is three fifths and tangent theta is less than zero, what is the value of cosecant? Okay, and so on this one to help us out, I'm gonna translate cosine, tangent, and cosecant into its ratio. So cosine is x over h. So we have that x divided by h equals three fifths. So I've translated that. Tangent is y divided by x. So y divided by x is less than zero. And what we're trying to solve for is cosecant, which is h over y. Now that I've written that out, we can make some observations. Uh, X is three in this problem. H is five, which means over here, if X is three, we have Y divided by three is less than zero. And over here, if uh, H is five, we have that our answer is going to be five divided by some value Y. Are you okay with what I've done so far? How I just kind of substituted, I substituted two rounds. I substituted the ratios in for the trigonometric functions. And then I substituted the values of X and H into these two ratios. Are you cool with that? All right, let's go start with uh, the second here. We have Y divided by three is less than zero. Let's isolate Y here. How do you, uh, what's the mathematical opposite of dividing by three? multiplying by three. So if we multiply by both sides by three, we should discover that y is less than zero times three, which happens to be zero. This means, and I'm gonna put this in as a note, note, y is negative. Being less than zero implies that it's negative. And that's gonna matter for us in a second. Uh, over here, I can't do anything. Other than to say, I know it's going to be a negative answer. I could put a negative symbol if you want, but that's all I know so far. Now, how am I going to solve this? Well, I'll add a visual. At this stage, you don't have to add this visual, but I will do so. We know the x value is positive 3. So I'm going to draw an x-axis that goes right 3 units. And I know I'll have a negative y value because of this line right here. So I'm going to draw my y-axis going down. Okay, so here it is. There's your Y, it's going down. Here's your X, it's going to the right. I'm gonna go right three units, one, two, three. We don't know why, but what I will do is I'm gonna put on the length. If this is a length of three, then I need a hypotenuse length of five because remember H is five. So I'm just gonna assume if that's three, that maybe that length would be five. And so I'm gonna curve it down to about right there. So that's my best drawing trying to represent that X is equal to positive three, hypotenuse is equal to positive five. We know from step one, like I said on the previous problem, step one, the angles need to be on the X axis. So I'd make this be my right angle and I would make this be theta. The Y is still unknown. All we know that it's negative. And so what's another way of finding a variable or a side length if you know two sides? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, let's use Pythagorean theorem here. And I don't use x squared, or excuse me, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I use x squared plus y squared equals h squared, hypotenuse squared. 
So we'll plug in our values to solve. X is three. Y we know is gonna be negative, but we don't know what number it is. So I'll just leave it as Y squared. Is it gonna equal my hypotenuse squared, which is five squared? All right, three times three is, or three squared rather, nine. nine. That is what three squared means, three times itself. Okay, and then five times five or five squared. We're trying to isolate the Y here. So right now nine is adding to Y. What's the opposite? Whoops, I was about to write the answer. Minus nine, okay. Uh, brilliant students with mental math capabilities. What is 25 minus nine? 16, very good. 16, all right, last step. What's the mathematical opposite of a square? Square root. Whenever we apply a square root, we should always mathematically, that's not originally there, let me rephrase. Apply a square root that's not originally there, have a plus or minus with it. However, this problem, we don't need plus or minus because what have we already discovered about y? It's negative. So saying y equals plus or minus four is not necessary in this one. We're just gonna say y equals negative four. And so we now have our answer, it's negative four. That would be your answer there. All right, and now number three here. It says find the link, by the way, these first two were problems of reviewing lesson four one. Both of these were four one. Uh, this is here four two. Uh, find the length of the intercepted arc with a central angle of 60 degrees in a circle with a radius of 15 centimeters, round to the nearest 10. So I'm gonna start off with what I know. They said circle. So circle, I can do that. It said a radius of 15 centimeters. I can do that, pretty simple. Whoops. Your radius is 15 centimeters. And it also told me it has a central angle of 60 degrees. That just means that there's an angle coming from the center that represents 60 degrees. Now, 60 degrees is somewhere in there. So I'm just gonna draw it that way. So now I have theta here equals 60 degrees. And I also have a second radius. I'm gonna use a little vocabulary. You would call this the initial side of the angle. This would be called the terminal side of the angle because that's where the angle ends. So you start on the x-axis positive x-axis and you move towards what would be the y-axis if I had to put those in there, the x and y-axis, you move that way. Okay, so there we have the picture. It asks us to find the arc length or the intercepted arc. It means what is this length from here to here? And so we could guess and say, oh, it's really close to what my radius is right now. So it might be around 15. They use the letter S for this. We don't know exactly, unless we use the formula from last class. So the formula we learned last class is that if you're in radians, it's just the angle times the radius to find your arc length. However, this is in degrees. Does anybody remember the, how you convert from degrees to radians? What was our conversion? Had to do with half a circle. How long of circumference or a portion of the circumference is half a circle? Pi. Uh, half degrees is in half a circle. 180. That's right. So our conversion was that pi radians equals 180 degrees. So here's how you'd convert. Uh, this is the formula if it's in radians. If it's in degrees, you need to cancel out the degree symbol, which means you put degrees down below with pi up top. And so this is what we put in our calculators uh, once we substitute our values in. Notice the degree symbols will cancel each other out. So the angle is 60. The radius is 15 centimeters. I multiply by pi, divide by 180. Uh, this would be degrees as well and the degree symbols will cancel each other out. As a reminder to you, um, 
in mathematics, normally you don't type the pi in the calculator and you leave the answer in terms of pi. This says to round, so I'll do it both ways, but we're, so here's the way that this problem actually wants the answer. It would want it as a decimal. So you would type in the pi and say, okay, to the nearest 10th, this would be 15.7. And that's the answer that this problem would be looking for, 15.7 and our units centimeters here. And that would be our solution. Uh, the exact answer that's not rounded would be if you took off the pi and replace it, we have one pi there. So I'm just gonna replace it with the one. My computer froze on me, let me try that again. There you go, one. The exact answer would be five pi. So I took out the pi and then I did all the other calculations and then I'm gonna add the pi back and say it's five pi centimeters. That would be the exact answer without rounding. This is the rounded answer, rounded and exact. So there you have it. There's the bell ringer uh, review of lesson 4.1 and 4.2. I know uh, last time 4.2, we didn't quite get to finish. We, I have not gonna forget about that example in area. We'll come back to it. But first we're gonna cover lesson 4.3 because it's more important here. And then I'll hit that extra area here um, in the next, either today or next class. Okay, so lesson four, three. In a nutshell, what we're gonna do is turn uh, our triangles into circles and circles into triangles. That's kind of the way I think about it. This is, like I said, very important for mathematical theory. Uh, a unit circle is what you're gonna hear me say a lot today. Or if you look up at the top of your notes, you might see the word, unit circle. What that implies is you're dealing with the circle that's radius is one in length. So that's why they call it a unit circle, not unit circle or units circle, like plural. It's a unit, unit singular, meaning the radius is one in length. The R would equal one, which means this point right there would be on the x-axis, one unit to the right, and not up or down, it would just be zero right in the middle. So you'd label that point as one zero. And, and this might be overkill, but just to make sure we're following, if it's one unit all the way around, what would this point's coordinates be? Meaning as in terms of X comma Y, what would its coordinates be for this point? Zero one is correct. What would this one's coordinates be? Negative one, zero, good. And this point, zero, negative one, good. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at, hey, what do you do whenever you have like an angle like we just did, like that 60 degrees, how can you solve it on the unit circle? And how could you solve it as a triangle? How do they cooperate together? So like the problem I just did, how they would connect is you could say, okay, if this angle is 60 degrees, what we're gonna learn today is uh, one of the topics is called a um, reference angle where this 60 is the reference angle and you can create a reference triangle from that angle. And you could use your same trig to solve from the circle, making it a triangle like this, where you take any point straight to the x-axis. The x-axis is always the rule. And you could solve it as a triangle. We're also gonna learn today, if you opened up this tab that I suggested, that you can use a unit circle to solve the problem the same way by using these values right here, that this will tell us our X, Y, and down underneath will be our hypotenuse. So uh, all that's what we're gonna go over today. Um, that's kind of just a teaser of how, what we're gonna do today is apply these triangles and circles together. All right. So with, uh, without further ado, let's get started with the lesson. And so the lesson starts with this item from the textbook it says, hey, with circles, you don't have to do opposite adjacent hypotenuse terminology. You can actually use X's, Y's, and R's, which is exactly what I've been teaching you, but for triangles. The textbook doesn't realize it works with triangles. It does. It works with triangles. It, what the textbook does know is it works for circles. And so you'll see the same relationship. The only thing they've substituted is they use the letter R. Why would they use an R for a circle? The radius, yeah. But what I'm gonna show you today is you can actually connect it and treat it like a triangle if you prefer. It's like two different ways of solving the same problem. You can do it either way. You could call it a hypotenuse and then you have the same ratios that I have right there on my trig calculator. 
So what I want you to first observe is that uh, the radius and hypotenuse are the same thing. Okay, so for a circle, a radius and the hypotenuse are always the same thing. And then you have the same relationship. But I'm gonna go back to unit circle. All right, why does it do that every time? Okay, so let's start with example one. It says, let negative four three be a point on the terminal side of an angle. Terminal again, just means the ending side of an angle in standard position. Find the exact values of the six trigonometric functions of pi. So this negative four three is a X and a Y value. So normally when we think of X's and Y's, we would draw an X axis and Y axis. And I think this is probably the quicker way of solving this one. When we see X of negative four, that would indicate to us, we need to go left four units on the X axis. And the Y tells us we need to go up three units. And so we have this point right there. And so oftentimes, um, what we would do is just kind of draw a triangle. And we're gonna do that. But when it says terminal side of an angle, what that means is the initial side always is on the positive X axis. The terminal side would be here. And so according to their problem, theta would actually be represented in this spot. And they would be looking at a triangle, the way they've set it up, like with the words they've used, this is kind of the idea they would be using. It's where this triangle would go right there. And so obviously I made this a little too long on that side. There we go. That would be the idea. But what I would indicate for us, I think on this problem would actually be simpler is to do it the way we've been doing this, where we say, okay, I'm gonna take this and discover the X value, or excuse me, that would be the Y value up and down. That's the Y value. Here's my X value. And I'm gonna solve this like a triangle. What we're gonna to learn today, this is brilliant math, this is really cool, is that this angle in here is what we call a reference angle. This angle mathematically will solve with the exact same answers as this angle out here. It's brilliant, but it works. It's really cool. As long as the angle's on the x-axis, it'll work every single time. It's really neat. Uh, so here's how I would solve this. I would list that the x is negative four, the y is three, and I would ask you from previous days, how would you find your h, your hypotenuse? Or you could call it your radius if you wanted to. If you have both x and y, how could we find our hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, there we go. Let's use Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to say that x squared plus y squared equals h squared. So when I substitute our values in, because the x is negative, I need to put it in parentheses. Because when you square, order of operations, if you don't use parentheses, you would technically square the 4 first and then make it negative. But this doesn't say that it wants negative 4 times negative 4. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. My y is 3. Since it's positive, it doesn't need to be in a parenthesis. And that will equal h squared. What is negative four times negative four? Positive 16. That's where the parentheses make a difference. Uh, let me switch colors here. We are at positive 16. What is three times three? Nine. nine. That equals h squared. Okay, we'll do a little addition. 16 plus nine is 25. And then uh, mathematically, how do we get rid of a square? Square root. And remember the rule. With pluses and minuses, you remember that? Anytime you had a square root that's not originally there, what goes with it? Okay, but new rule here, rule. Hypotenuse or radius are always positive. I guess that's not new. Okay, so here a little English can seem confusing because I use singular, but I wrote two words here. The hypotenuse or the radius, whichever one you're using, whatever term you want to use, is always positive, no matter what. So I'm actually going to say that H is positive 5. Okay, so if we ever have a negative in the problem, it's going to be dealing with either the X or the Y, or maybe even both can be negative if it's a third quadrant. But the hypotenuse will always be positive. So now we can find our six trig functions. And so to write them out, remember that was the sine. So according to the rhyme, sine is Y cosine is x, 
tangent is that's right okay so sine is y cos is x tangent is y over x let's plug in our values on this one my y is three my h is five so it'd be three fifths here this would be negative four fifths tangent is y over x so three over negative four now the reciprocals are csc cosecant is the reciprocal of sine so five thirds secant sec is the reciprocal of, the reciprocal of cosine it is five four, over negative four and then uh, cotangent cot is the reciprocal of tangent it would be negative four over three and so uh, i don't have these written down on this slide maybe i should add that but uh, those would be our values right there that you could go to the pre-programmed calculator if you needed to get the ratios okay your first dol is i have a problem very similar uh, that you can use to solve this i'm going to save you some time i want you just to find the sine value as coincidence has it if you just find the sign you'll be able to find your answer so on this one i'm actually going to cover up some of your values here. And I want you to draw whatever you need to draw and solve uh, for sine given this point right there. All right, uh, I'm gonna start drawing here. not going to solve this for you it is a dol but i am going to say okay here's my x here's my y this should be x this should be y as a coordinate point which means i need to go left three units and up six units maybe i shouldn't have spaced out those points so far four five six and so what i would assume most students would probably choose to be easier especially since i haven't really gotten to circles is to draw this as a triangle rather not focusing that on being a terminal side just kind of looking at it as a triangle and going from there where your x is negative three your y is six h is unknown and so you can go through the math we've just done to find your h but um i'll give you a hint you can eliminate a couple answers if you remember the rule what did i tell you is true always about h it's always positive. That's right. And so since sine is y over h, and we know that y is positive 6, you know you're dividing it by a positive. So you have a positive divided by a positive. I'll give you a hint. That should eliminate a couple options for you. But you could solve from there. Okay, let's take now a look at example two. And so for those who are following along here in 2021, um, this is not, this is gonna show up uh, out of order on PowerSchool Learning, okay? This was example five. This morning I shifted it to example two. I think it'll make more sense for our lesson. So if you're taking notes on the packet here in 2021, you need to look at example five to find this one. It says, let secant be the square root of 29 over five where sine is greater than zero. Find the exact values of the five remaining trig functions. All right, so let's go over. Uh, before I show you that, let me go back here. The wrong one, here. Secant is h divided by x. So here's what I have. This is kind of like uh, bell ringer number two, this problem right here, very similar. Secant is h over x. So h over x is the square root of 29 over five, which establishes something for us. X is five, H is square root 29. By the way, if there happened to be a negative out in the middle right here, negative never goes with H, it would have to go with the X. That's just because of the rule of H is always positive. Okay, now this says sine is greater than zero. So sine is Y over H. Y over H is greater than zero. Now we know what H is h is the square root of 29 so i'm going to plug that in right there 
So I have y over square root 29 is greater than zero. And so I just do like my little math to get y isolated, to get it by itself. What's the opposite of dividing by square root 29? Multiply. We multiply both sides by square root 29. And what we discover is that y is greater than zero times anything is simply zero. We discover y is positive. I'm just going to put it in brackets as a note. y is greater than zero, which means it's positive. So when I draw my triangle this time, I know x is positive 5, and I know y is positive. So I'm going to draw it representing a first quadrant. I know X is positive, five, one, two, three, four, five. I know Y is positive. I don't know what the value is, but I know it's positive. And so now let's just draw a little triangle. I go five units here. Uh, square root 29 is in between the square root of 25 and 36. The reason I choose those two numbers is square root 25 is five, square root of 36 is six. This value, the hypotenuse is just going to be a little bit longer. It's not even going to be a whole unit bigger. It's going to be something like that. So I'm going to draw it about right there. Now, this is just a guess. It doesn't have to be accurate, but I put my angles on the x-axis. X is 5. H is square root 29. A y is unknown other than it's positive. So how could I solve for my y? Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to abbreviate. I'm just going to say Pythag theorem. All right, we'll say x squared plus y squared equals hypotenuse squared. In this case, I have, let me switch colors. That was an x there. So we have x squared. No, not an x. I want to put this as 5 squared. There we go. 5 squared plus y squared equals square root 29 squared. Okay. Uh, 5 squared, what's 5 times 5? So we have 25 plus y squared equals square root and a square, cancel 29. The 25 is adding to y squared. Since I'm trying to isolate y, how do I get rid of addition of 25? We subtract 25 from both sides. And so we have y squared equals four. We take our square root and technically a square root that's added should have a plus or minus. However, we know y has got to be positive. So I'm just going to say y is positive too. And now we know that value. And so we can find our six trig functions. Here's their picture they drew. You'll notice the only thing different when you use a circle is you'll find out that they put the y axis by the uh, theta rather than by the right angle. And that's the only reason the shape looks different, but everything else is correct. X is positive five, Y is positive two. They just put the Y axis in a different location. That's why the shape looks mirrored going to the right as opposed to this one where it's going to the left or skewed left. Okay, uh, let's find our values. Sine is Y over H. So Y is two, H is square root 29, two over square root 29. Cos is x over h, so 5 over square root 29. Sine is y, cos is x, tangent is y over x, 2 over 5. For sake of space, I'm going to delete their little diagram. Let's do reciprocals. Cosecant is the reciprocal. Before I reduce any of these square roots or rationalize denominators rather, to use proper words, I write out all six. It'll save you work later on if you write them all six out first, then do your trick for the denominators. This is going to be square root 29 over five. And then cotangent will be five divided by two. Now at this stage, come back over and say, all right, I got to get these square roots out of there. So you shoot it up, so it becomes two square roots of 29. And the denominator, it just becomes a positive 29. Those cannot reduce, 29 is prime, so it stays. Uh, five square root of 29, same thing. 
five cannot go into 29, 29 is prime, so it does not reduce the stays. And there's your six functions. All right, um, your problem is way too easy. Whereas example one was a little difficult, yours is way too easy. Uh, again, I'm just gonna ask you to find the sine value. Notice all four, sine will give you the answer. And why this is so easy is they give you cosecant. So um, focus your problem on finding sine and you should be able to get your answer in a matter of seconds. Uh, if this is not a ratio, it's supposed to be. CSC is supposed to be a ratio. It doesn't look like a ratio. What have you learned earlier in your life? If it's not a fraction, how do you make it a fraction? Like, what do I put at this over? Over one. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds to solve this now. All right, let's move on to example three. And this is where the lesson, in my opinion, gets fun. We're going to start using this unit circle. So it first talks about quadrantal angles. For those that are here in 2021, they're using the packet. Now you can go back to example two. This would be, from the rest of the way, you should be in order uh, borrowing. I, there's a couple I'm going to skip until later. Uh, quadrantals, what that means is that the angle is on either the x-axis or the y-axis. So shown here, these are all four quadrantals. An angle on the x -ax positive x-axis, one on the positive y-axis, one on the negative x-axis, or one on the negative y-axis. And there's the radian measures. This is where we're going to use unit circle from here on out. So uh, I'm going to shrink this over so that you can kind of see both. And I might actually try to blow this up just a little bit more. Here we go. So that you can see all the values a little bit easier. I'm going to show you how to use these. So we're going to focus on the quadrantals, the quadrant lines here, the x-axis and y-axis. All right. So over here, let's look at example one. It says find the exact value of cosine pi. If not to find right undefined. Now let me show you the unbelievable use, uh, the beauty of a what we call a unit circle. So this over here, in case you didn't catch that at the start of the class, this is a unit circle, which means if you check out the points uh, on the radius, like if you had a radius here, this radius is a length of one. So on a unit circle, here's the beauty, is each one of these coordinate points that we think of as being x comma y, is going to actually be x over h, because our h is one. What's anything divided by one itself? It's technically x over h, y over h, which means each point is cosine comma sine. Now, where did I get that? We know that cosine is x over h. And if these x, y values all have a hypotenuse length of one, because the radius is one all the way around, then that's the same thing as x over h, because it's just x over one, and one is the h. So x over h is cosine, y over h is sine. So what does that mean? If you're trying to find cosine of pi, you find pi right here, and you ask yourself, so let me just write it down. Pi on the unit circle generates the value negative one comma zero. Negative one is the cosine. Zero is the sine. So the answer to this problem would be negative one. Pretty brilliant, isn't it? Was that easy or was that hard? Answer, easy. We looked at pi, we took the point, and we just said, okay, cosine the x, sine's the y. You remember that? Sine's y, cos is x. There you go. All right, let's try it again, just to make sure I'm not going crazy here. This says, find tangent of 450. Uh, by the way, here's their picture, and that's showing you where pi is and why it's that point. That right there is the cosine. Okay, what about 450 degrees? Well, 450 degrees, as you notice, isn't on this diagram because uh, this is going to, at example eight, we're going to talk about more of this. So we're on example three right now. But this is around the circle more than one whole time. It's the word's going to be a period or what we used last class. It's coterminal. So we have to find what is 450 coterminal with? Well, uh, if you're in degrees and you make a full circle. So here's my initial side. And now I'm going to do my terminal side. 
If I make a full circle, how many degrees did I just go around? 360. So how many is left over to get to 450? 90, which means we're right there. What we do to get to 450 is I do a complete 360 and then 90 more. So this y-axis in degrees is 90 degrees or it can be 450. These two angles are what we call coterminal. We learned about this last class. I didn't have a ton of time to go over it other than to say how mathematically to find them. But as far as solving goes, you, they're going to be equivalent to one another. That's why I put an equal sign. 90 is not the same thing as 450. That's, those are different numbers. But mathematically, 90 degrees is equivalent to 450 degrees because they're coterminal, same location. So what do we do? We go to our chart and we find out that 90 degrees, I'm now gonna write it down from the reference chart. 90 degrees finds the point zero comma one. Now we're trying to find the tangent. Sine is y, cos is x. Tangent is y over x. So tangent of 450 is gonna be equivalent to tangent of 90. And that is the same thing as y over x. Or I don't need to write the y over x here. Um, tangent and in, in, just say tangent theta, there we go. What the angle unknown is y over x. So, it is just one divided by zero. Now, are you allowed to divide by zero in mathematics? You're not allowed to divide by zero in mathematics. So this one would be called undefined. Our answer is undefined because you're not allowed to divide by zero. That was a domain rule we learned in the first semester. So this one would be undefined, but that's how we use the unit circle. Okay, let's give you this one. All right, so I'll give you a few seconds to try to solve this on your own. DOL number three. One thing I forgot, I did mention it, but I didn't make a big enough deal of it. If you're looking on the value and it's not a fraction, what do you put underneath the number? So like there's four values on here that do not have fractions. What do you put underneath if it doesn't have a fraction? Very good, Melissa. She says over one. Put it over one. Okay, for this particular problem, what I need to do here is I need to find three pi over two, whoops, three pi over two, and see that that generates the xy coordinate of zero comma negative one. And I'm gonna remind you that if it's not written as a ratio, because these values represent the ratio X divided by H, Y divided by H, that means it's being divided by one. Where, as I put in the notes or on this side, the zero would be your X, the negative one would be your Y, and these values, these positive ones, would be your h. So now you can go, go from there to solve for secant. All right. Uh, if you don't have your answer there, it's OK. Um, maybe it'll make more sense as you see more of these. I want to do a lot. Hold on. I told you when to get to example eight. We're only on example three right now. So if you don't have your answer yet, we'll come back maybe. Uh, or you could type it in the calculator. It's kind of cheating, but it will. for this, it will be able to solve that. All right, let's take a look at example four. So example four is starting to talk about reference rules. We're about to reference angles. We're about to put all this together. I kind of showed you this at the very start of class. We're, get, we're going somewhere with all this, okay? So I'm just piecing everything together. Now we're gonna take a look at reference angles. Here's what a reference angle is. Let's say you go to graph this. And if you're gonna graph negative 150 degrees, here are the two things you do when you graph is you uh, start always, always, always. Start with your initial side on the positive x-axis. So this is the initial side of an angle. It always points at the x-axis. Now, for the terminal side, if it's positive, it moves towards the y-axis like this. Since this is a negative angle, what that means is it needs to move towards the negative y-axis. So you go down this way. So that means this right here would be negative 90 degrees. 
And if you went all the way over here, it'd be negative 180. We want negative 150. So it's, uh, there's negative 90. I need to go 60 more degrees downward like that. So this would represent, or something similar to it, a negative 150 degree angle where this was negative 90 degrees. And if you went all the way over here, you get to negative 180. Now, just as a teaser, I wanna remind you that normally this is listed as 270. These would be what we call coterminal. Now this, when I say te teaser, it means it doesn't apply to this problem. And the negative 180 would be the same thing as positive 180. Why I'm showing you this is just to prepare you for the end to make more sense about it. So you can see it a couple more times. That term coterminal just means they look like different numbers, but mathematically they'll give you the same answer every single time. Now we want to find a reference angle. What a reference angle is, it's the value that if you connected this angle, the terminal side, to the nearest x-axis to make a triangle out of it, specifically a reference triangle, it's the angle that becomes on the x-axis. So in this case, it would be what is that angle right there? And the symbol we use is O apostrophe, theta, or not O, theta apostrophe, which they actually call theta prime. And so to find theta prime, you have to think about, well, how many degrees would there be if I went all the way across? Answer, 180. We've gone 150 of them. I'm gonna ignore the negative because the negative is just telling me a direction. It's not actually changing it. So there would be 180 to get all the way around. I've gone 150. Theta prime would equal 180 minus 150. Now, what is 180 minus 150? 30. So my reference angle is 30 degrees. And what you would learn is that angle 30, or what it's going to get to, means this value over here on 30 degrees, if you look at it, the x, y's, and h's, ignoring the negatives, will be exactly the same as uh, negative 150, by the way. It's coterminal to 210. The math we learned last class is you just add 360. If you look at the values at 210, the x, the y, and the h's are exactly the same. It's just well, this one has negatives because it's in the third quadrant. Third quadrant's left and down, and so they're negatives. But the math numbers are the same as 30 degrees. So that's what a reference angle is. Hope that makes sense. So there's the picture there. Um, let's look at part B. It says sketch three pi over four, then find its reference angle. So I'm gonna look over here rather than just tell you where it's located. You see three pi over four, it's located right in the middle of the second quadrant. So three pi over four, I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time. Here's my X axis, here's my Y axis. The initial side of an angle is always, always, always on the positive X axis. The terminal side, since this is positive, means I go towards the positive Y and I get to three pi over four. That's gonna be our three pi over four. Radians, three pi over four. There's our angle. The reference angle would be the angle that connects it. Why didn't it go blue? The angle that connects it to the nearest x-axis like this. So if I look at it, going all the way around would be a value of pi. We've gone three pi's over four. So if you just think about your rules for common denominators, oh, I need to put a prime there. This theta prime is going to be the amount of pi over fours it's missing to get from three pi over to four to one whole pi. Now, how many is it missing? One pi over four, that's what it's missing. So that's what the answer is gonna be. So here's the math, uh, theta, uh, theta prime would equal one pi all the way there minus three pi over four. And uh, just because we don't deal with fractions very often, I'll write it out as an extra step here. What you would do if you're getting all your steps is you would write this as a common denominator. So one pi is like four pi's divided by four minus three pi's divided by four. And we find out that our answer is one pi over four. And so at this stage, I'm gonna give you the reference angle rule. The reference angle rule is the reference angle is always a value that ends up could be found in the first quadrant. 
the meaning if it's degrees, it'll be between zero and 90. And if it's radians, it's gonna be between zero and pi over two. So reference angle rules, reference angle rules is that the, uh, if you're in degrees, your reference angle is always gonna be between zero and 90, not equal to, but in between. Or if you're in radians, it's always gonna be between zero and pi over two. Again, pi over two is the same thing as 90. Zero degrees and zero radians are the same thing. So there's your reference angle rules. And so in the future, it's a lot easier when you go to subtract, knowing that with fractions, it's just gonna be the denominator value you're missing. So I was using pi over fours. It was gonna always be one pi over four. That was always gonna be the answer. Okay, so uh, let's, you try to find a reference for 520. I'll give you a hint. You're gonna have something coterminal here. So you're gonna have to go around the circle more than once to solve this one. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with on this particular problem is this. If you would have remembered the reference angle rules, two of these angles are impossible. So if you remember these two rule or these two the ang reference angles rules, two of them are impossible. But for 520, what I'll leave you with is this. You always start there and you go to work around. It's positive. So you go all the way around, which is how many degrees? 360. So equivalent is 520 minus 360 is an equivalent value to be looking at. What's equivalent is 520 minus 360, which I believe is 160. So that would be the equivalent of 520. Uh, it'll be equivalent mathematically to 160. So think about there connecting to the x-axis what you would get, okay? Um, when you connect it this way. Think about that right there would be O theta, uh, theta prime. Okay, with that, Let's go on to ex uh, the next example. We're gonna start using um, these values. And I think I just placed this in the wrong spot, maybe. Oh, no, no, it's how to use it to evaluate, sorry. Uh, so now let's see, if you're finding with the reference triangle, you don't need to know about reference angles per se. So it says find the exact value of sine four pi over three. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to go to the reference uh, or the unit circle this reference chart and find pot four pi over three. So let's look on here for four pi over three. And here it is, four pi over three generates the value negative one half comma negative square root of three over two. And what I wanna remind you is this is equivalent to x over h comma y over h or said another way, this is cosine, this is sine. So in this problem, our answer is very simple. It's going to be negative square root of three over two. That's our answer. So what's the business with the reference angle? Well, if you're at four pi over three, the reference angle this is what's so nice about radians is if you connected this to the x-axis, you are one pi over three past one whole pi. So the reference angle would be one pi over three. If you look at one pi over three, notice that your numbers themselves, the number of values, are the same. The only thing that's different is the negatives because this is in the third quadrant. So since it's over here in the first quadrant, you, you could use this value, which is pi over three over two. And then because four pi over three is supposed to be in the third quadrant, you know, since it's going down, the y would have to be negative. The sine, which is y, would have to be negative. So that's what, how a reference angle works. So that's what they're showing you here. This is the reference angle. That's the actual angle. Mathematically, they'll give you the same solution though, other than the negatives. That's the only thing the reference angle won't give you is if it's negative or positive. It'll just always give you the positive. Okay, so let's try part B. Whoops, I didn't even cover that one up. Tangent 150. Well, how many degrees is this from 180? If you connected it to its closest x-axis to make a triangle. 30. 30, thus that's the reference angle. But to solve it the way I've been doing it, I take 150 and I'm gonna find the point. The x, y coordinate is negative square root of three over two comma one half. Once again, this is cosine, this is sine. 
or you could think of it in terms of x divided by h comma y divided by h. So we're finding tangent. Remember, tangent is y over x. So in this problem, I would take my y and divide it by my x. So I would have uh, 1 divided by negative square root 3. The negative goes with the x. It never goes with the h. So I'm here. Can I leave my answer in this form? Can I leave a square root in the denominator? Can we be more specific? Nope, can't. So what do we do with that square root? We shoot it up. So we have 1 square root of 3 over negative 3 which uh, would simplify just to be square root of three over negative three. It doesn't matter honestly where the negatives are. As long as you have one negative, uh, you could put it out front, you could put it up top, you could put it wherever you wanted to. As long as it's just one negative, you're fine. Let me actually write it that way. I guess it might be easier later for note, note takers. Negative square root of three divided by three. I'll just put it up front. So that would be the answer here on part B. All right, and I forget, do I have a part C on this one? Okay, part C for the note takers, that's the one I think I've kicked to the end of the lesson. It deals better with example eight. So I've kicked that one around. All right, your turn, DOL uh, number five. All right, so on this one, if you found your four pi over three, sine is y, cosine is x, you should be able to get your answer just by visual without doing any math work. All right, uh, we're gonna start tying some things together now, okay? So we've had a lot of random pieces of lesson. Let's start applying them together. Example six, it says a student programmed a 10 inch long robotic arm to pick up an object, which in this case is a tennis ball, at point C, rotate it around through an angle of 150 degrees, in order to release it into a container over here. So some type of, uh, whoops, container over here. I'm not a very good artist, but you get the idea. It's gonna drop it in that container. Uh, find the position of the object at point D. So we wanna know what is the position of this object in terms of X comma Y. So what that means, if it's X comma Y, is somewhere we have to have an origin. And it says the pivot point is, is O here. That's the origin. So I'll add on an X and Y axis. And I'm going to cover up some of the words. I'm aware of that. But I need to, if I'm going to have my circle properly fit on this X and Y axis. So here's my X and Y axis. X, Y. And I'm going to have a circle to show you. This is where the... Um, the object of the ball is going to come through. So it's gonna go from C, from this point, over around to D. Does that make sense? Kind of the idea of the picture? Now, as I showed you earlier in the lesson, you can solve this using a triangle as well. You could say here, here, and here, and use a triangle. Now, I did everything earlier with a triangle. Now, let me show you how we can use the unit circle to solve. So we could go through this process and say, okay, that's 150 degrees. This theta is 30 degrees. And um, the hypotenuse is 10 inches. You could use all that in just triangle, but I'm not gonna solve this with triangle this time. I'm gonna use the unit circle. I'm gonna go to 150 degrees and say, okay, 150 deg degrees generates the point negative square root of three over two, comma one half. Now, if you remember on the unit circle, all of this is solved with a radius being a length of one. So the radius is a length of one on the unit circle. On this problem, my radius is 10. So what do you do? You take your point, and since it's been scaled from one to 10, you just scale this one also from one to 10, which means another way of saying this is you multiply the values by 10, negative 10. Not negative 10, I'm sorry, positive 10. Come on, Mr. Voorhees, radius are always positive. Can't be negative 10. So I multiply this by negative 10. If I said it again, positive 10. There you go, goodness gracious. So we'll distribute that through and we'll find out the, the XY coordinate 
is going to equal, when I multiply by 10, uh, instead of multiplying inside the square root, I'll ask you this. If I put the 10 out front, what's 10 divided by 2? 5. And there's a negative. So I'm going to make it negative 5 square root 3. And then over here, what's 10 times a half? 5. That's my solution. Now, isn't that a nice little way to solve the problem? Was that pretty easy? That was easier than doing our sine cosine tangent of solving for the y and the x. We could have looked by the picture and said, I know the x is negative because it's left and the y is positive because it's up. But we would have had to go through all that trick. Now we can use unit circle. It's just another tool for when you have values that fall on the unit circle to solve very quickly. So I've given you one. Here, this problem, though, I'm not going to lie, the words are pretty tricky. So uh, I'm going to help you get started before I actually make you um, solve this problem on your own. It says this, a foot, four foot long minute hand on a clock on a bell tower shows the time of 15 minutes past the hour. What is the new position of the end of the minute hand relative to the pivot point at five minutes before the start of the next hour? So there's a lot of words here. I'm going to draw a little shape to help you out. Let's just say that's my clock. And y'all, if you've seen a clock before, know that you have, uh, you have 12 up top, six at the bottom. You have nine and three on the sides. And then, so this is 15 minutes. It goes like this, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So this would be like, five minutes here, somewhere in there. I'm just gonna put it, let's say, let me look at my clock to kind of get a good idea where it should be about right there. And this would go through this way. 10 minutes is somewhere over here. And then it's the same concept on this side. Uh, why I'm doing this is I think it'll really help you solve the problem to make sense of what's going on. So here's the clock. And it looks like this, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, so let's see what times it says it is. It says that uh, 15 minutes past the hour. 15 minutes is pointing at the 3. So that's the initial side. And it says also... There's another one that's at uh, five minutes before the next hour, which means it's pointing at the 11. So that's what they've given us. This would be our angle here, theta. And if you compare it to the chart, it's going to represent 120 degrees. Theta is 120. So I'll put that there. Theta is 120. And the reference angle, by the way, would be the how much it takes to connect over here. Your reference angle would be 60 degrees on this one. It'd be 60 degrees to connect it to the nearest x-axis. Okay, from there, I'm going to let you solve. Uh, oh, I forgot to put on here. The radius is four feet. And both of these would be radiuses. So the radius is four feet. I'll let you solve from there. And one more thing, it says, you're, just to make sure you're clear, you're trying to find the X and Y value right here. What is the, I'll have to move that X comma Y. Sorry, my zoom is tripping out on me. There you go, that's what you're trying to solve for. All right, I'm going to now move on and we'll take a look at uh, example seven and eight and finish up this lesson here. So example seven, uh, this is walking through what I've been telling you all day. I told you this lesson's a lot of little pieces and I've been trying to piece it together in advance, but this is where and by order of the textbook, they tell you that X represents cosine, Y represents the sine. It's the same thing I've been telling you for a while. Cos is X, sine is Y. And so they come up with this relationship. Now, the truth is, as we see this, this is all assuming that the radius is one in length. 
if the radius is not one in length, you just distribute in the front, just like I've been telling you a second ago. So what some students will write down on this stage is that you could either put R or an H here. I'll just say that H sine of the angle will always equal Y, always. It doesn't matter what the radius is. H times the cosine will give you your X. Tangent will always just simply be the Y divided by X. But for these two, if you want Y and X to be by themselves, you multiply by that hypotenuse. It's just the algebra to get from here if cosine's x over h and sine is y over h, it's just the algebra to get those letters by themselves. You multiply by h. Uh, why this doesn't have the h on here, or in their case, the r for radius, is simply because this is going off a unit circle where the radius is one. You see how that length is one right there? And multiplying by one, you wouldn't have that. But this would be a rule that applies no matter what the circle is. Whether it's one or whether it's a million and one, it would work this way. So now let's start finding these. Um, and we've been doing this, so let's go through it really fast. This is where, according to the lesson, we would fully use this reference chart. It would say, okay, find si seven, sine of seven pi over six. So you would go to seven pi over six, which by the way, is the same thing as 210 in degrees. And you take your point negative square root three divided by two. I put the negative with the X because it's never with the hypotenuse and negative one half. We want to know the sine by way of reminder, cosine is always the X, sine is always the Y. So the answer to this problem would be negative one half. That's our solution. No extra work required. Part B says, find the exact value of cosine pi over three. So I'm gonna find my angle for pi over three or my coordinate rather. So at pi over three, which is equivalent to 60 degrees, my coordinate is one half comma square root of three over two. Remember that the front is always cosine. The back, the Y is always sines. Sine is Y, cos is X you would get one half as your answer here. Seven C here, it says find the exact value of tangent four pi over three. So I'm gonna go find four pi over three. Four pi over three is located here in the third quadrant. So it's gonna be negative one half comma negative square square root three over two, where, as I've been writing, this is cosine, this is sine. But this problem we want tangent. So here's what I wanna remind you of. This is equivalent to X divided by H, Y divided by H, because cosine and sine, that is what they are. That is cos, this is sine that technically there's that silent H. So for this problem, the H is two, which means uh, X is negative one, Y is negative square root three. So if tangent is Y over X on this problem, I need to have negative square root of three divided by negative one. Two negatives make a positive. And when you divide by one, it's just itself. So the answer is square root of three. And is this the one I have D? Yes, example D and I think I have an E here as well. All right, so now let's find secant of 270. So you find 270 and here it is, 270 has the value zero comma negative one. And I wanna remind you that if there's not a fraction, you could rewrite it as being divided by one, just like this. So there was a DOL earlier, I said, hey, if you don't have your answer, we can come back later. This is the one that I would recommend going back if you needed more help. So this now is my X divided by H and my Y divided by H. Or said another way, this is my cosine. 
this is my sign. Well, sec uh, secant, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So what that means is I just need to flip my cosine value. So it would be one divided by zero. That is secant of 270. Now, are you allowed to divide by zero? That's undefined. So this one, you're not allowed to do that. It would be undefined. Is my answer this time. You're not allowed to divide by zero. I think I have one more. I think I also have an E on this one, if I remember right. Nope, I'm wrong. All right, tangent seven pi over six. All right, so let's finish up this lesson. Now let's talk about when you have what's called a period, which means something is coterminal here. You're gonna go around the whole unit circle more than once. So the last examples I'm gonna show you are values that you won't actually find on your unit circle. There are values that are too big or too large. So the first one I have is cosine nine pi over four. With degrees, most students just can do the math real fast, but with radians, we run into hiccups. So here's the way I do this. I always ask myself, is it almost or a little bit more than how many whole pies? So for example, four go, does not go into nine, but what's the closest number that four does go into, the closest number to nine that four does go into? Eight. So if it were eight pi over four, it would be four pi, uh, excuse me, two pi. So I'm going to say this is a little bit more than two pi. So what does that do for me? If it were two pi, starting from here, zero, two pi gets me right here, all the way around. Since it's a little bit more than two pi, where I'm actually going to look is in this first quadrant. I'm going to find the pi over four in the first quadrant, which simply is pi over four. So that means cosine of nine pi over four will be equivalent mathematically to cosine one pi over four. That's the term what we've used before called coterminal. And what the previous slide also calls, so I'll say or a period. And so these two would be equivalent. The answer here would be the square root of two divided by two. It is now the end of fifth period. All right, example B, it says find the exact value of sine negative 300 degrees. And if you check this out, negative 300 degrees does not uh, consist on our unit circle. And so what we can do is use coterminal or the period idea of a function with sine, meaning that if you add or subtract 360, you will get a mathematically equivalent value. So one thing you could do, and I did not do it on this way in the last problem, but you could do it this way, is just simply at the start, add 360, and find out that sine of negative 300 will be equivalent to sine of 60 because of, uh, this is what the term period actually means, that sine is periodic, meaning every 360, it'll give you the same exact value, nothing different at all. So what does that mean for our unit circle? Well, if we looked at it this way, here's our x-axis, here's our y-axis, um, I'm gonna start with the initial side pointing at the positive X and on the terminal side, negative 300 would go like this. This is negative 90, negative 180, negative 270, and I gotta go 30 more. That right there would be negative 300. That's negative 300. That's my angle there, negative 300. That, let me do that again one more time. Negative 300 degrees. Well, what we learned earlier in the lesson was about reference angles, this reference angle would be 60 degrees. And so that's why these two are equal to one another. It's just whether you do a positive or a negative, you're in the same terminal location. That's why they call it coterminal. So these would be, that's another term you can say here, coterminal. Those two are coterminal. Okay, so we go to solve. And so uh, now I would look over at 60 degrees, again, which would be equivalent of uh, th ne uh, negative 300. So negative 300, which is equal to 60 mathematically, will generate the point one half comma square root of three over two. And since I'm looking for sine, 
that right there is the cosine. This is the sine. We get an answer of square root of three over two. And now let's do the last two. Here's example 8c, find the exact value of tangent 29 pi over six. So now when I deal with pi's, I don't do the add or subtract 360. Honestly, what you could do in the calculator, this is beyond two pi. This is more than around at one time. What you could do is say 29 pi over six and subtract two pi. You could do it this way, which the same, that's the same thing as saying 29 pi over six minus six is my denominator. This would be 12 pi over six. And that would give me, uh, let's see here, 17 pi over six, which is still beyond two pi. And so I would do it again, 17 pi over six, whoops, minus 12 pi over six. And I find out this is five pi over six. And so these would be coterminals. Let me write the word coterminal, coterminal. You could do it this way, what I've just done here for that. It's coterminal with that, which is also coterminal with this. All that is five pi over six. You could do it that way. The other way I did it earlier in example A, as I said, this is, is it more than or almost how many whole pi's? Well, six doesn't go into 29, but six could go into 30. So you could say this is almost five pi. It's almost five pi because if it was 30 pi over six, which that means you start here at zero. If you went around that right there is one pi. This right there would be two pi. This right there would be three pi. This right there would be four pi. And it's almost five pi, which means it would be somewhere over here this would be equal to five pi. These are coterminals I'm writing out. And I could have just put the zero right there, um, just to have them all on the line. And so since I'm almost uh, five pi, I'm looking for the pi over six that's in the second quadrant. And so this would be right here, my value. Notice it's also five pi over six, just like I got right there. So 29 pi over six would be equivalent to five pi over six. And so my mathematical value uh, for 29 pi over six, which equals five pi over six is negative square root three over two. That's not an ugly three. Let me rewrite that one more time. Three over two comma one half. And since I'm looking for tangent, I need to take the y over x. So I'm gonna take the top values here. Um, remember this is your X, that's your Y, those are your H. So I would have one over negative square root of three over two, which will equal negative square root of three over three when you reduce. And that would be my solution there. And I got one more for you. I got one more here. Let's find cotangent of seven pi over two. This right here is equivalent. If you just think about it as a decimal, it's uh, 3.5 pi. And so it's a more than, you can either say more than three pi. It's less than four pi. And so on a chart here, I have zero, this would be one pi, this would be two pi, this would be three pi, and this would be four pi if I went all the way around. Since it's right in the middle, this one's gonna locate here. So seven pi over two is going to equal three pi over two, which the point there is zero comma negative one. And if I put it over H again, cotangent is X over Y. 
So cotangent theta is x over y. You're taking zero over negative one, which the answer would be zero. So here's a DOL for you now. Oh, I'm sorry, I got one more. Secant four, 15 pi over four. This is a little bit, uh, it's almost rather, almost four pi. And so almost four pi. There's one pi, two pies, three pi. This one's almost four pi. So you're looking at the pi over four in the fourth quadrant. And so when I look over here, I find out that that's seven pi over four. So I'm just drawing a quick line here. That 15 pi over four is equal to seven pi over four. And so I can solve from there. Secant is going to be the reciprocal of the X. So if I have square root of two over two, let me close this off right here. Square root of two over two and then negative square root of two over two. The secant is the opposite of, or the reciprocal of cosine. That's my cosine. So it'd be two over square root two, which when I shoot that up to the top, I'd have two squares of two over two. And now finally, the square root of two. Now I have one for you to try. All right, now let's take a look at how this might look on the ACP. Uh, point P is rotated 210 degrees clockwise, counterclockwise around a circle with a diameter of 20 meters, which if its diameter is 20, that means the radius is 10 meters. So this right here is 10 meters, and so is this one, 10 meters. It says if the center is at the origin, what coordinate represents P prime relative, that's what they call it symbols, P prime, relative to the center being here, uh, zero, zero. Okay, so we wanna know what is that value in terms of X comma Y? And so the easiest way, if it's 210 degrees and you have a reference trying, uh, reference your unit circle right here, is to find this value and multiply it by 10. Again, you could make a triangle out of this, and I believe if you just check when I made this video as an ACP prep or made it individually, this is the way I do it as a triangle. But it's easier if you apply what we learned today, just take 10 and multiply it times the point because this is for a uh, circle with a radius of one. This is a radius of 10. So you just have to multiply the values by 10. So it would be 10 times uh, 210 is here negative square root three over two comma negative one half. And when I distribute this 10 through, I would get my answers, which would be um, negative five square root three and negative five. That would be my solution. And I got two more here and here. Uh, which angle has a negative sine and a negative cotangent? So uh, we had we didn't get to talk about that that much throughout this lesson, but sine is like your y, and so whenever you hear that it has a negative sine, that means nothing in the first top two quadrants could be a positive or it could be value because that would be a positive y. So nothing up here. So I pi over sevens in the first quadrant, five pi over eights in the second quadrant. It's more than half a pi, but less than one whole pi. So you're comparing it off of this. Uh, let me see, that's pi over two. This is three pi over two, and this is zero. And so it's gotta be one of these two that's more than one pi, but yet still less than two whole pi. So it's gotta be somewhere in there, but it has also a negative cotangent. So we know if sine is negative, what that means is that y over h was less than zero. And when you multiply by h, that y was less than zero. That's the first thing from here, that sine is negative. Well, if cotangent is negative, here's what we know. Cotangent is x divided by y, and y we just found out is negative, so I'll write it this way. This cotangent is also going to be less than zero. Now, if you multiply by a negative y, put that in parentheses, 
that goes away. But whenever you multiply, your inequality has to switch signs when you multiply by a negative. So that means that X is going to be greater than zero. So it can't be over here either. So we're looking for the fourth quadrant value, which is D. D is in the fourth quadrant, nine pi over five. That's almost two pi. It's almost right here on this line. So it's in this quadrant. And now what is the exact value of tangent negative four pi, 14 pi over three? You could type this in the calculator and then match decimals if you wanted to, but just using coterminal to finish this one off, negative 14 pi over three is almost negative five pi, almost negative five pi, because that would be negative 15 pi over three. like that, negative 15 pi over three. Okay, so if I wanted to solve this one, um, I need to, here's my initial sign on the x-axis. My terminal side would go around, there's negative one pi, negative two pi, negative three pi, negative four pi, almost negative five pi is somewhere over here. So just to write these out, that's equal to zero, to two pi, to four pi. This was equal to one pi, three pi, these are coterminals, and five pi. This one's almost five pi, so it didn't quite make it all the way around this next time. It stopped right there. Uh, so I'm looking over here for the pi over three. I guess if I wanted to draw it more accurately, I would need to have it more like that, because it's the pi over three. And so I'll write that in here. This reference angle is pi over three because of our denominator. So I'm looking for the tangent of the pi over three value, which here it says that the X is negative one, Y is negative square root three and H is two. I want tangent, which is Y over X, so negative square root three divided by negative one. I'm getting square root three. We can check our answer real quick by just going to the calculator and typing these in. Tangent negative 14 pi over three. We're saying the answer is square root three. It looks like they match up, so we did it correctly.